Hello, and welcome back to Brendan Moyer's Playwright Corner, where I read plays, poems, or whatever is currently striking my fancy at the moment. Today we're going to be finishing out J.M. Singh's collection of plays with The Playboy of the Western World, written between 1905 and 1907. The persons are Christopher Mahone, Old Mahone, his father, a squatter, Michael James Flaherty, called Michael James, a publican, Margaret Flaherty, called Pegine Mike, his daughter, Sean Keogh, her second cousin, a young farmer, Philly O'Cullen and Jimmy Farrell, small farmers, Widow Quinn, a woman of about 30, Sarah Tansy, Susan Brady, Honor Blake, Nellie McLaughlin, our village girls, a bellman, and some peasants. The first production was in Dublin on the 26th of January, 1907. Christopher Mahone was played by W.G. Fay, Old Mahone by A. Power, Michael James by Arthur Sinclair, Pegeen Mike by Marie O'Neill, Sean Keogh by F.G. Fay, Philly O'Cullen by J.A. O'Rourke, Jimmy Farrell by J.M. Kerrigan, Widow Quinn by Sarah Allgood, Sarah Tansy by Bridget O'Dempsey, Susan Brady by Alice O'Sullivan, Honor Blake by Mary Craig, and Peasants by Harry Young and you Wright. The action takes place near a village on a wild coast of Mayo. The first act passes on a dark evening of autumn, and the other two acts on the following day. Act 1. Country Public House or Shabine. Very rough and untidy. There is a sort of counter on the right with shelves holding many bottles and jugs just seen above it. Empty barrels stand near the counter. At back, a little to the left of counter, there is a door into the open air. Then, more to the left, there is a settle with shelves above it, and more jugs in a table beneath a window. At the left, there is a large open fireplace with turf fire, and a small door into inner room. Pegeen, a wild-looking but fine girl of about twenty, is writing at table. She is dressed in the usual peasant's dress. Pegeen, slowly as she writes. Six yards of stuff for making a yellow gown pair of lace boots with lengthy heels on them and brassy eyes. I had a suitor for a wedding day, a fine-toothed comb, to be sent with three barrels of porter and Jimmy Farrell's creel carts on the evening of the coming fair to Mr. Michael James Flaherty, with the best compliments of this season, Margaret Flaherty. Sean Keogh, a fat and fair young man, comes in down right center and looks around awkwardly when he sees that she is alone. Where's himself? Pegine, without looking at him. He's coming. She directs letter. To Mr. Seamus Mulleroy, wine and spirit dealer, Castlebar. Sean, uneasily. I didn't see him on the road. Pegine, how would you see him? Licks stamp and puts it on letter. And at dark night with this half an hour gone by. Sean, turning towards door again. I stood a while outside wondering when I would have a right to pass on or walk in and talk and see you, Pegine Mike. Comes to the fire. And I could hear the crows breathing and sign in the stillness of the air and not a step move in any place from this gate to the bridge. Pegine, putting a letter in an envelope. It's above the crossroads he is. Meeting Philly O'Cullen and a couple more are going along with him in Kate Cassidy's wake. Sean, looking at her blankly. And he's going that length in the dark night? Pegine, impatiently. He is, surely, and leaving me lonesome on the scruff of the hill. She gets up and puts envelope on dresser, then winds clock. Isn't it long the nights are now, Sean Keogh, to be leaving a poor girl with herself counting the hours till the dawn of day? Sean, with awkward humor. <laughs> if it is, when we're wedded in a short while, you'll have no call to complain. For I've little will to be walking off to wakes or weddings in the darkness of the night. Pegine, with rather scornful good humor. You're making mighty certain, Shanine, that I'll wed you now. Aren't we after making a good bargain? The way we're only waiting these days on Father Riley's dispensation from the bishops or the court of Rome? Pegine, looking at him teasingly, washing up at dresser. It's a wonder, Shanine, the Holy Father'd be taking notice of the likes of you, for if I was him, I wouldn't bother with this place where you'll meet none but Red Linehan, and a squint in his eye, and Pechine is lame in his heel, or the mad Mullerines were driven from California, and they lost in their wits. We had a queer lot these times to go troubling the Holy Father in his sacred seat. Sean, scandalized. If we are, we're as good this place as another, maybe, and as good these times as we were forever. As good, is it? Well, now you meet the like of Deneen Sullivan, knocked the eye from a peel or a Marcus Quinn, God rest him, got six months from Maimon News, and he a great want to tell stories of Holy Ireland till we'd have the old woman shedding down tears about their feet. Where will you find the like of them, I'm saying? Sean, 
timidly. If you don't, it's a good job, maybe, far, with peculiar emphasis on the words. Father Riley has small conceit to have that kind of walking around and talking to the girls. Pegeen, impatiently, throwing water from Basin out of the door. Stop tormenting me with Father Riley, imitating his voice. When I'm asking only what way I'll pass these twelve hours of dark and not take my death with the fear. Looking out of door. Sean, timidly. Would I fetch you the Widow Quinn, maybe? Pegeen, is it the like of that murderer? He'll not, surely. Sean, going to her, soothingly. Then I'm taking himself will stop along with you when he sees you're taken on. For it'll be a long night with great darkness, and I'm after feeling a kind of fellow above in the first ditch, grown and wicked like a maddening dog the way it's good cause you have, maybe, to be fairer now. Pegine, turning on him sharply. What's that? Is it a man you've seen? Sean, retreating. I couldn't see him at all, but I heard him groaning out and breaking his heart. It should have been a young man from his words speaking. Pegine, going after him. And you never went near to see was he hurt or what ailed him at all? I did not, Pegine, Mike. It was a dark, lonesome place to be here in the like of him. Well, you're a daring fellow. And if they found his corpse stretched above in the dews of dawn, what do you say then to the peelers or the justice of the peace? Sean, thunderstruck. I wasn't thinking of that. For the love of God, Pegine, Mike, don't let on I was speaking of him. Don't tell your father and the men is coming above, for if they heard that story, they'd have a great blab in this night of the wake. I'll maybe tell them, and I'll maybe not. Sean, will you whist, I'm saying? Pegine, whist yourself. She goes behind counter. Michael James, fat, jovial publican, comes in down right center, followed by Philly O'Cullen, who is thin and mistrusting, and Jimmy Farrell, who is fat and amorous, about forty-five. Men, together. God bless you. The blessing of God on this place. Pegine. God bless you kindly. Michael, to men, who go into the counter right. Sit down now and take your rest. Crosses to Sean at the fire left. Are you coming over the sands to Kay Cassidy's wake? I am not, Michael James. I'm going home the shortcut to my bed. Pegine, speaking across from the counter. He's right to. And have no shame, Michael James, to be quitting off for the whole night and leaving myself lonesome in the shop. Michael, good-humouredly. Isn't it the same whether I go for the whole night or part only? And I'm taking it's a queer daughter you are if you'd have me crossing backward through the stooks of the dead woman with a drop taken. Pegeen, angrily. If I'm a queer daughter, it's a queer father to be leaving me lonesome these twelve hours of dark, and I pile in the turf with the dogs barking and the calves mooing and my own teeth rattling with fear. Jimmy, flatteringly. What is there to hurt you when you a fine hardy girl would knock the head of any two men in the place? Pegeen, working herself up. Isn't there the harvest boys with their tongues red for drink? and the ten tinkers is camped in the East Glen and a thousand militia bad sesum walking idle through the land. There's lot surely to hurt me, and I won't stop alone in it. Let himself do what he will. Michael, if you're that of fear, let Sean Keogh stop along with you. It's the will of God I'm taking himself should be seen to you now. They all turn to Sean. Sean, in horrified confusion. <clears throat> I would, and welcome, Michael James, but um, I'm afeard of Father Riley. And what would all the Holy Father and the Cardinals of Rome be saying if they heard I did the like of that? Michael, with contempt. God help you. Can't you sit in by the hearth with the light lit and herself beyond in the room? You'll do that, surely, for I've heard tell there's a queer fellow above going mad or getting his death maybe with a gripe in the ditch, so she'd be safer this night with a person here. Sean, with plaintive despair. I'm afeard of Father Riley, I'm saying. Let's he not be tempting me and we ne'er married itself. Philly, with cold contempt. Lock him in the west room. He'll stay then and have no sin to be telling to the priest. Michael, to Sean, getting between him and the door. Go up now. Sean, at the top of his voice. Don't stop me, Michael James. Let me out of the door, I'm saying, for the love of Almighty God. Let me out. Trying to dodge past him. Let me out of it and may God grant you his indulgence in the hour of need. Michael, loudly. Stop your noise and then sit back by the hearth. Gives him a push and goes to counter laughing. Sean, turning back, wringing his hands. Oh, Father Riley and the saints of God, where will I hide myself today? Oh, St. Joseph and St. Patrick and St. Bridget and St. James, have mercy on me now! He turns round, sees door clear, and makes a rush for it. Michael, catching him by the coattail. You'd be going, is it? Sean, screaming. Leave me go, Michael James, leave me go, you old pagan! Leave me go or I'll get the curse of the priest on you and of the scarlet-coated bishops of the courts of Rome! With a sudden movement, he pulls himself out of his coat and disappears out the door, leaving his coat in Michael's hands. 
Michael, turning around and holding up coat. Well, there's the coat of a Christian man. Oh, there's sainted glory this day in the lonesome west. And by the will of God, I've got you a decent man, Pegine. You'll have no call to be spying after if you have a score of young girls maybe weeding in your fields. Pegine, taking up the defense of her property. What right have you to be making game of the poor fellow for mine of the priest when it's your own the fault is? Not paying a penny pot boy to stand along with me and give me courage in the doing of my work. Michael, taken aback. Where would I get a pot boy? Would you have me send the bellman screaming into the streets of Castlebar? Sean, opening the door and putting in his head in a small voice. Michael James. Michael, imitating him. What ails you? The queer dying fellow's beyond looking over the ditch. He's come up, I'm thinking, stealing your hands. Looks over his shoulder. God help me, he's following me now. He runs into room. And if he's heard what I said, he'll be having my life and I going home lonesome in the darkness of the night. For a perceptible moment, they watch the door with curiosity. Someone coughs outside. Then Christy Mahone, a slight young man, comes in, very tired and frightened and dirty. Christy, in a small voice. God save all here. Men. God save you kindly. Christy, going to counter. I trouble you for a glass of porter, woman of the house. He puts down coin. Pegine, serving him. You're one of the tinkers, young fellow. It's beyond camped in the glen. Christy. I am not. But I'm destroyed walking. Michael, patronizingly. Let you come up then to the fire. You're looking famished with the cold. Christy. God reward you. He takes up his glass and goes a little way across to the left, then stops and looks about him. Is it often the polis do be coming into this place, master of the house? If you'd come in better hours, you'd have seen license for the sale of beer and spirits to be consumed on the premises, written in white letters above the door. And what were the polis want spying on me, and not a decent house within four miles the way every living Christian is a bona fide saving one widow alone? It's a safe house, so... He goes over to the fire, sighing and moaning. Then he sits down, putting his glass beside him, and begins gnawing a turnip, too miserable to feel the others staring at him with curiosity. Michael, going after him. Is it yourself as fearing the polis? You're wanton, maybe. There's many wanton. Many surely. With the broken harvest and the ended wars. He picks up some stockings, etc., that are near the fire, and carries them away furtively. It should be a larceny, I'm thinking. Christy, dolefully. I had it in mind it was a different word and bigger. Pegeen. There's a queer fellow. Were well, you never slapped in school, young fellow, and you don't know the name of your deed? Christy, bashfully. I'm slow at learning. A middling scholar only. Michael. If you're a dunce itself, you'd have a right to know that your larceny is robbing and stealing. Is it for the like of that you're wanting? Christy, with a flash of family pride. And I, the son of a strong farmer. God rest his soul, could have bought up the whole of your old house a while since from the butt of his tail pocket and not have missed the weight of it gone. Michael, impressed. If it's not stealing, maybe. It's something big. Christy, flattered. I. It's maybe something big. Jimmy. He's a wicked-looking young fellow. Maybe he followed after a young woman on a lonesome night. Christy, shocked. Oh, the saints forbid, mister. I was all times a decent lad. Philly, turning on Jimmy. You're a silly man, Jimmy Farrell. He said his father was a farmer a while since, and there's himself in a poor state. Maybe the land was grabbed from him, and he did what any decent man would do. Michael, to Christy, mysteriously. Was it bailiffs? Christy, the devil a one. Agents? The devil a one. Landlords? Christy, peevishly. Ah, uh, not at all, I'm saying. You'd see the like of them stories on a little paper of a Munster town. But I'm not calling to mind any person, gentle, simple, judge, or jury did the like of me. They all draw near with the lighted curiosity. Philly. Well, that lad's a puzzle the world. Jimmy. He'd beat Dan Davies' circus or the holy ministers making sermons on the Villania man. Try him again, Philly. Philly. Did you strike golden guineas out of solder, young fellow? Or shilling coins itself? Christy, I did not, mister. Not six pence nor a farthing coin. Jimmy, did you marry three wives, maybe? I'm told there's a sprinkling of done that among the holy Luthers of the preaching north. Christy, shyly, I never married with one, let alone with a couple or three. Philly, 
Maybe he went fighting for the bow as the leg of the man beyond was judged to be hanged, quartered, and drawn. Were you off east, young fellow, fighting bloody wars for Kruger and the freedom of the Boers? Christy, I never left my own parish till Tuesday was a week. Pegeen, coming from counter. He's done nothing so. To Christy. If you didn't commit murder or a bad nasty thing or false coining or robbery or butchery of the like of them, there isn't anything will be the worth your troubling for to run from now. He did nothing at all. Christy, his feelings hurt. That's an unkindly thing to be saying to a poor orphan traveler has a prison behind him and hanging before and hell's gap gaping below. Pegeen, with a sign to the men to be quiet. You're only saying it. You did nothing at all. A soft lad the like of you wouldn't slit the windpipe of a screeching sow. Christy, offended. You're not speaking the truth. Pegeen, in mock rage. Not speaking the truth, is it? Would you have me hit the head of you with the butt of the broom? Christy, twisting round on her with a sharp cry of horror. Don't strike me. I killed my poor father Tuesday was a week for doing the like of that. Pegeen, with blank amazement. Is it killed your father? Christy, subsiding. With the help of God I did, surely. And that the Holy Immaculate Mother may intercede for her soul. Philly, retreating with Jimmy. There's a daring fellow. Jimmy, oh glory be to God. Michael, with great respect. That was a hanging crime, Mr. Honey. You should have a good reason for doing the like of that. Christy, in a very reasonable tone. He was a dirty man, God forgive him. And he getting old and crusty the way I couldn't put up with him at all. Pegeen, and you shot him dead? Christy, shaking his head. I never used weapons. I have no license and I'm a law-fearing man. Michael, it was with a hilted knife, maybe. I'm told in the big world it's bloody knives they use. Christy, loudly, scandalized. Do you take me for a slaughter boy? Pegeen, he never hanged him, the way Jimmy Farrell hanged his dog from the license, and I had it screeching and wriggling three hours at the butt of a string, and himself swearing it was a dead dog and the peeler swearing it had life. Christy, I did not then. I just rizzed the loy and let fall the edge of it on the ridge of his skull, and he went down at my feet like an empty sack, and never let a grunt or a groan from him at all. Michael, making a sign to begin to fill Christy's glass. And what way weren't you hanged, mister? Did you bury him then? Christy, considering. I, I buried him then. Wasn't I digging spuds in the field? Michael, and the peelers never followed you after the eleven days that you're out? Christy, shaking his head. Never a one of them. And I walking forward facing hog, dog, or devil on the highway and the road. Philly, nodding wisely. It's only with a common weekday kind of a murderer them lads would be trusting their carcass. And that man should be a great terror when there's a temper roused. Michael. He should, then. To Christy. And where was it, Mr. Honey, that you did the deed? Christy, looking at him with suspicion. Oh, a distant place, master of the house. A windy corner of high, distant hills. Philly, nodding with approval. He's a close man. And he's right, surely. Pegeen. That'd be a lad for the sense of Solomon to have for a pop boy, Michael James, if it's the truth you're seeking one at all. Philly. The Peelers is fearing him. I knew that lad in the house there isn't one of them would come smelling around at the dogs itself or lapping poaching from the dung pit of the yard. Jimmy. Bravery is a treasure in the lonesome place. And a lad would kill his father and I'm thinking would face a foxy devil with the pitch pike on the flags of hell. Pegeen. It's the truth they're saying. And if it's that lad in the house, I wouldn't be fearing the lucid khaki cutthroats or the wakened dead. Christy, swelling with surprise and triumph. Well, glory be to God. Michael, with deference. Would you think well to stop here and be pop boy, Mr. Honey, if we gave you good wages and didn't destroy you with the weight of work? Sean, coming forward uneasily. That'd be a queer kind to bring into a decent, quiet household with the like of Pegeen, Mike. Pegeen, very sharply. Will you whist? Who's speaking to you? Sean, retreating. A bloody-handed murderer the like of Pegeen, snapping at him. Whist, I'm saying. We'll take no fooling from you like at all. To Christy with a honeyed voice. And you, young fellow. You'd have a right to stop, I'm thinking. For we'd do our all and utmost to contend your needs. Christy, overcome with wonder. And I'd be safe this place from the searching law? Michael. You would, surely. If it's not fearing you itself, 
The peelers in this place is decent. Trotty poor fellows wouldn't touch a cur dog and not give warning in the dead of night. Pegine, very kindly and persuasively. Let you stop a short while anyhow. Aren't you destroyed walking with your feet in bleeding blisters and your whole skin needing washing like a wicklow sheep? Christy, looking around with satisfaction. It's a nice room. And if it's not humbugging me you are, I'm thinking that I'll stay surely. Jimmy jumps up. Now by the grace of God herself will be safe this night, with a man killed his father holding danger from the door and let you come on, Michael James, or they'll have the best stuff drunk at the wake. Michael, going to the door with men. And begging your pardon, mister. What name will we call you for we'd like to know? Christopher Mahone. Well, God bless you, Christy. And a good rest till we meet again and the sun will be rising to the noon of day. Christy. God bless you. Men. God bless you. They go out except Sean, who lingers at door. Sean to Pegeen. Are you wanting me to stop along with you and keep you from harm? Pegeen, gruffly. Didn't you say you were fearing Father Riley? There's no harm staying now, I'm thinking, and himself is in it too. He wouldn't stay when there was need for you. And let you step off nimble this time that there's none. Sean. Didn't I say it was Father Riley? Pegeen. Go on then to Father Riley, and let him put you in the Holy Brotherhoods and leave that lad to me. Sean. If I met the widow Quinn, Pegine, go on, I'm saying, and don't be waking this place with your noise. She hustles him out and bolts the door. That lad would wear the spirits from the saints of peace. Bustles about, then takes off her apron and pins it up on the window as a blind, Christy watching her timidly. Then she comes to him and speaks with a bland good humor. Let you stretch out now by the fire, young fellow. You should be destroyed traveling. Christy, shyly again, drawing off his boots. I'm tired, surely. Walking wild eleven days and waking fearful in the night. He holds up one of his feet, feeling his blisters and looking at it with compassion. Pegine standing beside him, watching him with delight. You should have great people in your family, I'm thinking, with the little small feet you have and you a kind of quality name, the like of what you'd find on great powers and potentines of France and Spain. We were great, surely, with wide and windy acres of rich Munsterland. Pegin, wasn't I telling you? And you a fine, handsome young fellow with a noble brow? Christy, with a flash of delighted surprise. Is it me? Pegin, I. Did you never hear that from the young girls where you came from in the west or south? Christy, with venom. I did not then. Oh, they're bloody liars in the naked parish where I grew a man. If they are itself, you'd heard it these days, I'm thinking. And you walk in the world telling out your story to young girls or old. I've told my stories no place till this night, Pegging Mike. And it's foolish I was here maybe to be talking free. But you're decent people, I'm thinking. And yourself as a kind woman the way I wasn't fearing you at all. Pegging, filling a sack with straw, right. You've said the like of that, maybe, in every cotton cabin where you've met a young girl your way. Christy, going over to her, gradually raising his voice. I've said it nowhere till this night and telling you. But I've seen none the like of you the eleven days I am walking the world, looking over a long ditch or a high ditch on my north or south, into stony scattered fields of the scribes of bog where you'd see young limber girls and fine prancing women making laughter with the men. Pegine, nodding with approval. If you weren't destroyed traveling, you'd have as much talk in Streely and I'm thinking as own row O'Sullivan or the poets of Dingle Bay. And I've heard all times as the poets are your like fine, fiery fellows with great rages when their tempers roused. Christy, drawing a little nearer to her. You've a power of rings, God bless you. And would there be any offense if I were asking, are you single now? Piggin, what would I want wedding so young? Christy, with relief. We're alike so. Piggin, putting sack on settle and beating it up. I never killed my father. I'd be afraid to do that except I was the like of yourself with blind rages tearing me within. But I'm thinking you should have had great tussle in when the end was come. Christy, expanding with delight at the first confidential talk he has ever had with a woman. We had not then. It was a hard woman was come over the hill. And if he was always a crusty kind when he'd have a hard woman setting him on, not the devil himself or his forefathers could pick up with him at all. Pegin, with curiosity. And isn't it a great wonder that one wasn't fearing you? Christy, very confidentially. Up to the day I killed my father, there wasn't a person in Ireland who knew the kind I was. And I there drinking and waking, eating, sleeping, a quiet, simple, poor fellow with no man giving me heed. 
Pegine, getting a quilt out of the cupboard and putting it on the sack. It was the girls were giving you heed, maybe? And I'm thinking it's most conceit you'd have to be gaming with their like. Christy, shaking his head with simplicity. <laughs> Not the girls itself. And I won't tell you a lie. There wasn't anyone heeding me in that place saving only the dumb beasts of the field. He sits down at fire. Pegine with disappointment. And I thinking you should have been living the like of a king of Norway or the eastern world. She comes and sits down beside him after placing bread and mug of milk on the table. Christy, laughing piteously. <laughs> the like of a king, is it? And I, after toiling, moiling, digging, dodging from the dawn till dusk with never a sight of joy or sport, saving only when I'd be abroad in the dark night poaching rabbits on a hill. For I was a devil to poach, God forgive me. And I nearly got six months for going with a dung fork and stabbing a fish. Pegine. And it's that you'd call sport, is it? To be abroad in the darkness with yourself alone? I did, God help me. Watching the light pass in the north of the patches of fog till I'd hear a rabbit startin' to screech and I'd go runnin' in the furs. Then when I my full share I'd come walkin' down where you'd see the ducks and geese stretched sleepin' on the hills of the road. And before I'd pass the dung hill I'd heard himself snorin' out a loud lonesome snore he'd be makin' all times the while he was sleepin'. And he a man be raging all times the while he was wakin', like a gaudy officer you'd hear cursin' and damnin' and swearin' oaths. Pegine, providence and mercy spare us all. Christy, it's that you'd say, surely, if you'd seen him after he'd drinkin' for weeks, rising up in the red dawn, or maybe before, and goin' out into the yard as naked as an ash tree in the moon of May, and shying clods against the visage of the stars till he put the fear of death into the bannoffs and the screeching sows. Pegine, I'd be well nigh afeard of that lad myself, I'm thinkin'. And there was no one in it but the two of you alone? The devil o' one. Though we'd sons and daughters walk in all great states and territories of the world, and not a one of them to this day but would say their seven curses on him, and they rousing up to let a cough or sneeze maybe in the dreadness of the night. Well, you should have been a queer lot. I've never cursed my father like of that, and I'm twenty and more years of age. Christy, then you'd have cursed mine, I'm telling you. And he a man never gave peace to any saying when he'd get two months or three or be locked in the asylum for battering peelers or assaulting men. The way it was a bitter life he led me, till I did up a Tuesday and have his skull. Pegine, putting her hand on his shoulder. Well, you'll have a peace in this place, Christy Mahone, and none to trouble you. And it's near time a fine lad the like of you should have a good share of the earth. Christy, it's time, surely. And I, as seemingly a fellow with great strength in me and bravery of... Someone knocks. Christy clings to Begin. Oh, glory! It's late for knocking in this last while I'm in terror of the peelers and the walking dead. Knocking again. Pegine. Who's there? Voice, outside. It's me. Pegine. Who's me? Voice. The Widow Quinn. Pegine, jumping up and giving him the bread and milk. Go on now with your supper, and let on to be sleepy, for if she found you were such a warrant to talk, she'd be stringing and gabble till the dawn of day. Christy takes bread and sits shyly with his back to the door. Pegine, opening door with temper. What ails you? Or what is it you're wanting at this hour of the night? Widow Quinn, coming in a step and peering at Christy. I'm after meeting Sean Keo and Father Riley below who told me of your curiosity, man. And they feared him by this time he was maybe roaring, romping on your hands with drink. Pegine, pointing to Christy. Look now. Is he roaring? And he stretched out drowsy with a supper and his mug of milk? Walk down and tell that to Father Riley and Shanine Keel. Widow Quinn, coming forward. I'll not see them again, for I've their word to lead that lad forward to lodge with me. Pegin, in blank amazement. Th this night, is it? Widow Quinn, going over. This night. Isn't it fitting, says the priestin, to have his likeness lodging with an orphaned girl? To Christy. God save you, mister. Christy, shyly. God save you kindly. Widow Quinn, looking at him with half-amused curiosity. Well, aren't you a little smiling fellow? It should have been great and bitter torments did rouse your spirits to a deed of blood. Christy, doubtfully. It should, maybe. Widow Quinn, it's more than maybe I'm saying. And it softened my heart to see you sitting so simple with your cup and cake. And you fit to be saying your catechism than slaying your da. Pegine at counter, washing glasses. There's talking when any'd see he'd be fit to hold in his head high with the wonders of the world. Walk on from this, 
For I'll not have him tormented he destroyed traveling since Tuesday was a week. Widow Quinn, peaceably. We'll be walking surely when this supper's done. And you'll find we're great company, young fellow. When it's of the like of you and me, you'd hear the penny poet singing in an August fair. Christy, innocently. Did you kill your father? Pegine, contemptuously. She did not. She hit himself with a worn pick, and the rusted poison did corrode his blood the way he never overed it and died after. That was a sneaky kind of murder did win small glory with the boys itself. She crosses to Christie's left. Widow Quinn, with good humor. If it didn't, maybe all knows a widow woman has buried her child and destroyed her man as a wiser comrade for a young man than a girl the like of you, who'd go helter-skeltering after any man will let you a wink upon the road. Pegine, breaking out into a wild rage. And you'll say that, Widow Quinn, and you gasping with the rage you had racing the hill beyond to look at his face. <laughs> Me, is it? Well, Father Riley has cuteness to divide you now. She pulls Christy up. There's great temptation in a man did slay his da. And we'd best be going, young fellow, so rise up and come with me. Pegine, seizing his arm. He'll not stir. He's pot boy in this place, and I'll not have him stolen off and kidnapped while himself's abroad. Widow Quinn. It'd be a crazy pot boy and lodge him in the Shabim where he works by day. So you'd have a right to come on, young fellow. A perch off on the rising hill. Pegine. Wait till you lay eyes on her leaky thatches growing more pasture for her buck goat than her square of fields, and she without a tramp itself to keep in order her place at all. Widow Quinn, when you see me contriving in my little gardens, Christy Mahone, you'll swear the Lord God for me to be living lone, and that there isn't my match in mayo for thatching or mowing or shearing the sheep. Pegine, with noisy scorn, it's true the Lord God formed you to contrive indeed. Doesn't the world know you reared a black ram at your own breast, so that the Lord Bishop of Connaught felt the elements of a Christian and he eaten it after in a kidney stew? Doesn't the world know that you've been shaving the foxy skipper from France for a three-penny bit and a sop of grass tobacco would wring the liver from a mountain goat you'd see lep in the hills? Widow Quinn, with amusement. Do you hear her now, young fellow? Do you hear the way she'll be rating at your own self when a week's gone by? Pegine to Christie. Don't heed her. Tell her to go out into her pigsty and not plague us here. Widow Quinn. I'm going, I'm going. But he'll come with me. Pegine, shaking him. Are you dumb, young fellow? Christy, timidly to Widow Quinn. God increase you, um. But I'm pot boy in this place. And it's here I leave her stay. Now you've heard him. And go on from this. Widow Quinn, looking round the room. It's lonesome this hour crossing the hill. And if he won't come along with me, I'd have a right maybe to stop this night with yourselves. Let me stretch out on the saddle, Pegine Mike, and himself can lie by the hearth. Pegine, short and fiercely. Faith, I won't. Quit off or I will send you now. Widow Quinn, gathering her shawl up. Well, it's a terror to be aged to score. To Christy. God bless you now, young fellow. And let you be wary. There's right torment will await you there if you go romancing with her like. And she waiting only as they bade me say on a sheepskin parchment to be wed with Sean Keogh of Killakeen. She goes out. Christy going to Pegine as she bolts the door. What's that she's after saying? Pegine. Lies and blather you've no call to mind. Well, isn't Sean Keogh an impudent fellow to send up spying on me? Wait till I lay my hands on him. Let him wait, I'm saying. Christy. And you're not wedding him at all? Pegine. I wouldn't wed him if a bishop came walking for to join us here. Christy. That God and glory might be thanked for that. Pegine. There's your bed now. I've put a quilt upon you, I'm after quilting a while since with my own two hands. I need best stretch out now for your sleep. And may God give you a good rest till I call you in the morning when the cock crows. Christy. As she goes into inner room. May God and Mary and St. Patrick bless you and reward you for your kindly talk. She shuts the door behind her. He settles his bed slowly, feeling the quilt with intense satisfaction. Well, it's a clean bed, and soft with it. And it's great luck and company I've won with me in the end of time. Two fine women fighting for the likes of me. Till I'm thinking this night. Wasn't I a foolish fellow not to kill my father in the years gone by? Curtain.